Welcome back, my friends, to the Sweet Spot, where I leaders <laughs> share the insights with other leaders and others that want to lead. My name is Carlos Vargas, as and every week, I'm here with my two co-hosts, Howard Houghton and Paul Lewis. Hey, guys. Hey, Carlos. It's good to have you back. Thank you, it's sir. amazing to have you back. It's been too long. You've yes. just let us. You just let us go on by ourselves, aimless. Yeah, yeah, and and that energy is, is has definitely been missing because neither Paul nor I have that kind of energy to kick. We do not. We're much more like, "Hi, it's the sweet spot." We <laughs> hope we're not talking to an empty room. <laughs> and you're like emceeing a, a nightclub. It's fantastic. <laughs> So that is an actual really good segue to today. So if we're looking at all these things that we're doing, we're changing the way we do things, how we interact with people, how the way we connect. But historically, I heard something that we were talking. <clears throat> we used to get together in tribes and now we change. And I think that that applies to some of the behaviors that we're seeing now with COVID and after it. So what is today's topic? Because that's going to be a really good one. And everybody that is looking at this, make sure that you take your notebook and take notes because this is going to help you understand some of the behaviors that you're seeing from probably friends and family. And you say, why are they doing that? This episode is going to help you understand this. So the topic today is kind of the death of the tribe, the unintended the unintended consequence of a, of a global pandemic. <clears throat> um, I find sociology and, and anthropology to be incredibly fascinating, uh, mostly because I don't understand people even a little bit, and, and it really helps me kind of understand people. But one of, the, one of the, the, the interesting and cool things when you start studying these topics, right, which are, are basically um, the human psychology of crowd dynamics, right, how we fit into societies, um, is... Human society, right, the, the idea that humans have been um, roughly human-like and in groups of other humans is about 400,000 years old. Um, we could argue semantics on the exact date, but, but we're going to go with 400,000 years because this isn't a psychology and sociology pod podcast, but rather an IT podcast. Um, and in that time, we've only had about 1,000 years where people have been in what you would call cities. Obviously, there are exceptions, right? Rome goes back 2,000 years. There were cities at the time. But most people didn't live anywhere near a city, had never seen a city. And the reality is we're, we're designed to be tribal individuals. Um, I originally kind of learned about this when I was studying about New York. And there was an interesting study that came out um, trying to figure out why. Um, and it was they were studying New York, but New York isn't completely unique, right? But why New York got a, got a reputation for, for not caring about people. And what the study concluded was because of the, the hundreds of thousands of years of evolution, um, human beings really are only equipped to see and recognize and catalog about 100 people a day. And once you reach your 100 people, <clears throat> your brain kind of goes, no more people, I'm done. Right? <clears throat> and the problem with something like New York is you see 100 people in the first five steps you're on the street. Right. After which, your brain goes, okay, cool, we're all peopled out, no more people. And you stop seeing everyone else as a person. And they become not, like you don't, they're, they're not invisible. You don't, you, you know what I mean? Like your brain doesn't just go, well, that's not a living thing. You just stop seeing them at the same level that you see a person. Now, is that a hundred people per day or a hundred? Cause you're still walking, you're gonna see your friends, your coworkers, your dry cleaner, your guy you buy your fruit from, right? Well, that's, that's what's interesting about it is it's a yeah. hundred people per day, oh. right? And so, I can tell them that they're connected to you in some way. It's not about the connection, right? It's just about that's kind of the maximum you can actually take in in a day, right? So, um, so what it does is it creates this kind of kind of uh, issue where once you've hit your hundred, then then you're seeing um, effectively other animals, right? Mm -hmm. um, and and that means you don't treat them like people. Right? It's why the crowds operate the way they do. It's, it's, a, it's a mental defense mechanism to help deal with the fact that there's way more than 100 people there. There's more people than you could successfully acknowledge. Now, what's interesting, too, and how that applies to COVID, um, is knowing that when we look to what is the current tribe, what is the modern tribe, it's really work. Mm -hmm. right? 
Um, and the reason that it's work is because we're spending more and more and more hours in that social dynamic. We're getting less and less sleep. The hours that you spend working and listening to those same voices is becoming longer and longer, right? Mm -hmm. The time that you spend commuting is longer and longer. And if you just look at the amount of time that you're on the clock, you're, you're roughly spending 30% of your time in the office with those people. Add in breaks, lunch, drinks after, the commute right. time, all of the meetings that drift over, and you're really probably in the 10, 11, 12 hours a day, right? You're probably drifting closer and closer to 40 or even 50%. Right. Factor in the fact that you sleep for seven hours and see nobody, right? <clears throat> and you're probably sitting closer to the, like, almost two-thirds bucket. Right. And I'm willing to bet that were I to ask, and were all of our viewers to, to kind of think about this question, um, what, how much overlap is there in your social network between work and not work. I would imagine it's relatively high, mm. right? We start to think about those people that we work with as our friends. And one of the things that's commonly reported as a heavy stressor when losing a job is the loss of the friends network, right? Right. How many times have you had somebody that you hung out with a lot, you change jobs and all of a sudden you don't hang out with them anymore. And the stress of finding <clears throat> new friends in the new job. Absolutely, right? Yeah. Now it's a whole new social circle. My social circle is disrupted. I have to find a new social circle. Right. And my, you know, you know what I mean? And all of that that comes along with it. <coughs> um, and I think that's one of the biggest side effects to, to the loss of the pandemic. Because we are social creatures, even as a hardcore introvert myself, I'm still a social creature. In destroying the work-life balance, in destroying the work routine, and in destroying kind of our standard social mechanics, we've also destroyed our tribe, right? right? Good, better, and different. The tribe isn't what the tribe was a very short period ago. And I think that's one of the biggest unintended side effects of COVID is how do we deal with the fact that the tribe we built is no longer the tribe. In some ways, it's very similar to the mental stress of losing a job. That and now you have a, a federated culture holistically. So you used to go in the office, seeing that tribe, um, you know, having your your interactions and collaborations, um, and now you're on your own time, and everybody you know is on their own time. So you might be working six a.m. till ten. Everybody else is working ten a.m. till till eight. Right? Yep. So you're even off your timelines. Not on, not only just offline, off your relationships. So sorry for the interruption. Um, I have dogs, and apparently the dogs found the money that was in my other pants pocket. And Yikes. It's, less, it's significantly less money now. <laughs> <laughs> at least it's not hundreds. That's, I, I guess that's, that's one way to look at it. <laughs> <laughs> so how, if we think about this, have you seen anything that then people within the close proximity get affected more? Let's say we're working a lot more from home now. So if we don't see our significant others early on in the morning and we start in a bunch of video calls and connection with others, can that then start affecting that local relationship with probably spouse, kids, family? Well, absolutely, right? Um, if you think about it, you have a certain amount of interaction that occurs throughout the day, right? And that interaction is, is this kind of give and take mechanic. Um, and you've fallen into a routine where that energy goes out and that energy comes in. Um, and, and I think no matter how you look at it, there's some pressure involved in that energy, right? There's, there's some effort involved in that energy. <clears throat> throughout the typical day, if you, if you were used to interacting with 40 people, you kind of gave and took those 40 people, right? And the, and the kind of um, effort to deal with you was distributed amongst 40 people. Right. So how does that change when that, all of that effort has to go into three people? They're receiving a lot more energy from you than they normally would. Well, they're receiving a lot more weight of your personality, right? <laughs> right. Otherwise, you're, you're putting some percentage of your personality away. Right. kind of locking it up internally, and it's not getting out. Neither of which is a net zero balance. Right. right. 
there's either added stress from you not getting the communication that you need and desire, or there's the added stress from your from your family, those people that share the same address with you, now having the full weight of your personality on them when it wasn't when it was not there before. Mm -hmm. And and that goes both ways, right? If you're an extrovert, that can be really trying for people who are introverts who don't communicate nearly as much, right? Now they're feeling that full weight. If you're an introvert, <clears throat> you're now having to, to bear the brunt of extroverts. Right. So, so it's what's a, what's the net negative impact to to you as an individual and to the business that are now have to deal with a thousand of these individuals? Burnout. Heavy right. burnout, right? We're seeing a far greater sense of burnout, a far greater rate of burnout, a far greater rate of, of um, depression and um, unway, onway. Um, I can never pronounce that properly, but it's ennui? basically ennui, yeah. It's basically yeah. that feeling of, of uh, being adrift at sea, right? Mm. Um, <clears throat> and I'm not sure that, that, that there's a really good way to deal with it. Um, mm. I would say, one of the things that I would encourage is start your Zoom calls 15 minutes early. Keep your Zoom calls open 15 minutes later. Right? Start building in the buffers that naturally existed. If a meeting was scheduled at 9 a.m. and we all walked into a conference room, we didn't all walk in at 9 a.m. No. We started trickling in 10 minutes early. Sure. And until the content kicked off, we all chatted. We yeah. got to know one another. Right? Even if you didn't know everyone in the room, you introduced yourselves and said, hey, how you doing? Oh, hey, I noticed that you're wearing a you know, a, a Denver Broncos tie. Hey, the Broncos did good last week, right? Whatever it happens to be right. that, that, you know, the, the social cues that are there, you started to socialize. And the problem now is, cool, we're seeing each other's face, but are we actually socializing? Or is it just, hey, I'm giving you 37 minutes back in your day because we finished early. <laughs> Instead of giving 37 minutes back, think about how do I enable the socialization amongst the team, amongst the people, amongst the call, Right? Maybe throw a topic out for the first five minutes. Hey, did, you know, anybody watch anything good on Netflix? That'd be a right. great five-minute topic, right? It'll do two things. One, it warms the crowd up, right? Anybody that you're talking to, right? It kind of gets them in the sense of, hey, these are the people I'm listening to. I'm engaged. It's an interesting conversation. Um, and it adds that social, that kind of social value and helps to lower that stress. I don't have to be on to have that conversation. I have to be on to have a conversation about where my product is. I have to be ready to to both um, showcase it and defend it. But mm -hmm. I don't have to do that when it comes to my favorite show on Netflix that I'm watching today. Is there value in, um, I don't want to use it in force, but to um, allocate uh, a round robin version of that, right? So, so that everybody should and gets to talk in order to alleviate some of that obviously pent up stress because some people will talk and somebody some people won't talk in that situation but if you get everybody to do it it's at least getting everybody even in some way um the problem is the human mind isn't fair mm. right and the way we interact isn't fair and so i think i think what you'll end up doing is you'll end up with people who, who don't have an interest in actually talking but are fine listening Right. There's a lot of people that are better receivers than they are broadcasters, right. <clears throat> and you'll end up putting them in a, a position now where it's become stress again. Right. Um, and at the same time, <clears throat> wow. At the same time, someone who's a heavy broadcaster, giving them 20, 25 seconds to talk is probably not going to do them any favors either, right? So, <laughs> right. Uh, You're I, stressing I would, them. Yeah. Right. I would encourage it to be a lot more free form, and then I, I would absolutely encourage you know set up team meetings that don't have a schedule, that don't have a plan, that 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 are literally designed for that kind of communication, right? right. Send up, set up, set up some sort of social activity, whatever you can figure out how to plan and design to enable that that communication. Right? Um, I, I hate to say it, but but as adults, we probably be, because everything is so is so restrictive right now and so kind of regulated. Um, we probably should be thinking about um, setting up play dates as adults. <laughs> I, I know it sounds silly, but the fact is we're really, really good about that with our kids. Right. Right. And it's been so easy and so casual for us to do that as adults. We've never really had to think about it. Um, one of the best pieces of advice that I, that I have heard in the last, um, I don't know, month or so really is um, go for a walk. Schedule the walk with someone else in the office, call that person, and just chat like you would if you were going for a walk at the office. Hmm. 
right? 10 minutes, 15 minutes, 30 minutes. It's a fantastic way to, to kind of encourage it. And as a leader, encourage blocking the time on, on the employee's calendar. I know it might seem like we have a ton of stuff to do. We have an infinite amount of stuff to do. There's not enough time to do it in the day. Right. However, mental health is so tightly coupled with efficiency that any minute you can give someone to improve their mental health, you're going to get 10 back. Right? right. So as a leader, like we, we're actually celebrating this flexibility, right? We're celebrating this um federated culture and that everybody gets to control and manage their own time working at home in any means at any time they wish uh and effectively we've let the controls maybe too loose right maybe there is value in putting a little bit of structure even though it is as flexible as possible in order to ensure that those kind of things get done and that that structure might be a requirement for you to take at least X amount of hours off a week. We don't mean the weekend. We just mean this many percentages of the hours you, you shouldn't be working and you should, you should have to, you know, you should have to acknowledge that that's true in some way, right? You need to determine, not prove in some way that you're in fact taking this time off. Or uh, if you have four weeks vacation a year that we kind of say for the short term, you have to take once one week a quarter, right? Just to just to ensure that that isn't accumulating over time, and you're not working eighteen hour days and sleeping eight. It, is that is so, that a reasonable so, set of guidelines? Yeah, I mean, I, I think you um, there's something that you say often that I think fits this this perfectly, um, and that is uh, more versus better, mm. right? Do I want more hours from my people? Or do I want better hours for my people? Personally, I want better. I've always wanted better. Right. And so if that's the case, then what can I do to ensure that I get better hours for my people? And I think it's a combination of things, right? Um, one of the things that I try to do is I try to block time on my calendar for specific activity that's not meetings. Mm. Right. So I block time on my calendar for classes. <clears throat> right. I block time on my calendar for writing. Right. Um, so I encourage you, have your employees block time on their calendar for things that are not directly related to, to the process of their job. Right. Right? <clears throat> um, have them block time on their calendar for improvement, including mental health improvement. Mm. And then people are also kind of looking at, I can't really travel right now. It's not easy to travel. Um, so while it's possible, it's not easy. Um, there's Anxiety and fear that comes along with, with travel, justified anxiety and fear that comes along with travel right now, right? So encouraging people to take vacation, I'm not sure that that, that should be couched in quite that way. Mm. However, people do naturally take vacation days. And so I would encourage it, right? I would in absolutely encourage, you know, um, I'd like you to take a day off a month. Um, ideally, figure out you know, can can we make this work in a way that that maybe doesn't cost you the vacation day you're signing, you're, you're saving up, right? Um, right? However, that needs to happen. Encourage your employees to still take downtime and and you know really kind of focus on that because it's become too easy, right? Um, I get up in the morning, I sit, up, I come into my office, I'm on my laptop, I'm on Zoom, I'm involved in all these things, I spend all this time, I. I step away, I don't really leave the house, I have a meal, I come back, I'm back at the laptop, right at the end of the day, my laptop gets unplugged from a stocking station, it comes down to the couch, I sit in front of my laptop, staring at the TV, continuing to work, right? If someone sends an email, my response time went from maybe uh, an hour or two to, an, to a minute or two, right? right? Like, like the, there is no way to equalize the difference. And ultimately, we need to really equalize the difference, right? Maybe explain to your employees if they're not in um, if they're not in a position that requires emergency response, that emergency response is neither required nor appreciated. We've often said that there's no such thing as a CTO emergency. <laughs> right. right. It doesn't right. exist. It was, it's not it was a. One of the, the things you thing. told me that like third day I was here. I was replying to stuff at 11 o'clock or two in the morning or some crazy hour. And you're like, why are you replying? And I'm like, cause I've worked IT my whole life. So everything's an emergency. 
Right. The response to me was, I see no case in which there could be an enterprise architecture emergency. Right. The director of enterprise architecture, right? So <clears throat> I see no, no, no point at which there could be a CTO emergency. So how right. about you just ignore when I send the email, because I'm sending it when it's convenient. Right. How about you reply when it's convenient as though there were no emergency? Right. And, I, and I think that's a base conversation for everybody, right? The reality is uh, because my working times and working norm are different than yours and different than everyone, then you can't align to me. You can't align to everybody. You just align to yourself. Right. And if, if that meant you were off at noon today, okay. Right. You're, you're, I mean, you're not in the service desk, right? You're not in the support team. Right. You don't have a, a pager with you, right? You're, you're fine. But, but I would also say, even if you have a pager, even if you are in the service desk, right, it's incumbent upon every leader to, for, to correctly establish right. KPIs, to make sure right. that everyone understands what the KPI is. <clears throat> and look, we all love that employee that goes above and beyond. We really do. But I think we too often <coughs> don't think about the cost mm. that that has. And it's really, really, really easy when they're in the office. You clock in at eight, you clock out at five. I want maximum productivity from you from eight to five. Right. Do we do the same thing when they work from home? If they clock in at 7.30, do we have them clock out at 4.30? Do we ensure that they take their government mandated breaks? Right. Right. Or is it much more now the person that really was doing, you know, was at 120 percent of their KPI when they were in the office is now 170 percent of their KPI because they're just on all the time. Right. Right. And part of leadership is actually saying, slow down. Right. I want you to understand that your KPI is, I, I don't know, 100 tickets a week. Yep. I don't think that's a reasonable KPI, but it's just a number. So your KPI is 100 tickets a week. Right. I need you to concentrate more on your mental health. So start watching your tickets. When you start hitting 80, 85 tickets and it's Wednesday, I'd, I'd rather you kind of slow down rather than continue to burn yourself out, right? I care about your mental health. I want to ensure that your mental health is good. That's an interesting perspective. In fact, I would probably articulate it this way. Um, up till now, we're going to say up till March, um, KPIs have been very floor centric, right? Thou shalt do this much kind of stuff. But now KPIs have to be ceiling based. You shouldn't do any more than this stuff, right? That I don't expect you to work any more hours than this amount of hours, this many tickets, this many issues, this many emails, this many whatevers. You, there is a ceiling and I, I will choose and I suggest to you, you don't go beyond that ceiling. That, that's how you keep it within the range, right? I always had a 45 hour ceiling. Right, maybe 50 hour ceiling. And I would tell all my employees, like, if, if I expect, if you're putting in more than 50 hours in a week, that I have an email and I'm authorized at that time. And they were all salary. Like, it doesn't cost me dollars for right. them to do that, but it costs me time for them to do that. Right. There's tons of research that shows the reality is office workers are productive to about 30 hours a week. Mm -hmm. After that, their productivity goes down both directions. As in, when we get to 40 hours, they're less productive than they would have been at 25. We get to 50 hours, they're less productive than they would have been in the low 20s, right? Mm -hmm. And at some point of hours, we can never get the time back. So, right. like, we like to think that, <clears throat> and it is true, that shit happens. Right. right? There's some crisis, some system goes down, sure. it's all hands on deck, right? We've got people working 60, 70, 80 hours a week to get the thing back up and up and working to deliver the project on time, whatever it happens to be. <coughs> the problem is it's diminishing returns, right? And at some point, if you maintain that pace, you'll never be able to get the productivity back. You can't then drop to 30 hours a week and get the productivity back. You'll never do it. You, you mm -hmm. engage permanent burn, burnout. The 40 hour work week comes from when we were, we were working in manufacturing and working with our hands. And someone who, who works with their hands, who does a physical activity, their productivity really is about 40 hours, 38 to 42. <coughs> Sorry about the call. <clears throat> so here's where I think the complexity lies. I, I think all of these suggestions make a lot of sense and they could easily be, be proactively implemented. But a lot of it's for active work, right? Active work, creating a document, doing emails, 
uh, answering calls, being on Zoom meetings, creatively producing content. Uh, but how about the passive stuff, the think time? I'd say at least 50% of our roles is think time, right? We're, we're reading a bunch of stuff, we're connecting the dots, we're simulating content, we're thinking about what to write in the future, we're thinking about what the pod might be, we're, we're formulating an opinion in our head after listening and hearing. Like in a lot of that, I don't know if you can turn off, but it's almost like we need to encourage something else, different thought. We need to encourage a hobby. We need to encourage, you know, watching sitcoms. We need to encourage an, an effect to the think time as much as the active work time. So we're paid to think. Yeah. We're not paid to think linearly. We're not paid to think the same every time, right? We're supposed to be innovative. Right. Innovation does not come from routine. It's never come from routine. Not, right. not ever. Right. <laughs> so that's where a process efficiency comes from. Process efficiency is not innovation. <laughs> to be innovative, you need to change your routine. Mm -hmm. And so you, you hit on it, right? Develop a hobby. Um, I have a current count 687,000 hobbies. <laughs> right. <laughs> the reality is if you're going to pick a podcast, pick a podcast you wouldn't normally listen to. Right. Right. If you do all of your thinking from your desk, do your thinking from the porch. Put a put a chair on your porch. <clears throat> right? Go for go just go sit in the park. I do right. not like walking. It is not my favorite thing. Um, <laughs> I have mobility issues from motorcycle accident. It's never going to be a thing that I like to do. Um, right. that being said, I have a hammock on the on the front porch. And when it's not 100 degrees out, actually, I'm a wuss, so when it's not in the, in the low 90s out, like when it, <laughs> when it tops out at about 80, 85, I'll go sit in the hammock. I'll put my headphones in. I've got my, my iPad sitting nearby. And that's all just kind of uh, reflection time, right? right? I think about the things that I'm going to talk about. I think about the topics I want to write. Um, and frankly, don't make it all so work-related. Right. Um, write a short story. Uh, there's actually one of the things um, uh, a peer of mine did uh, when he worked at Blizzard and he ran support for Blizzard um, was he sent out writing tasks to all of his people and they were mandatory. They were assigned like every other task. Wow. And it was a 101, a 201, a 301. And he rotated them. And the deal was you, you wrote a story. There was no topic for the story. It could be anything you wanted. That was exactly 101 words, 202 words, or 303 words. Interesting. And that was the assignment. Um, and look, if you want to write a tech article that's 101 words, that's fantastic. Post it to LinkedIn. You know, rock on. Right. If you want to write a story of, you know, Mickey and Goofy that you're going to tell your kids that's 101 words, absolutely rock on. Go for it. <coughs> right. But it's those kind of things that I would strongly encourage. How was it graded? I don't know, like, how was it? Was it just... A number of words. I see. Uh, the thing is, by, by, by making a habit out of it, you don't actually have to grade it. Right. Right? People naturally get better. And if you notice that they have a ton of grammatical errors, what he did was he, su he suggested an extension, like Grammarly. Mm -hmm. Not that I'm advertising for Grammarly. <laughs> um, but, and, and do be aware that... Sweet spot, you, sponsored by Grammarly. Right. <laughs> And do be aware that if you choose to use Grammarly or one of those other things on your mobile device, all everything that you type on that keyboard is transmitted to their cloud server. So please, that's the that's the the uh, you know ding. The more you know. <laughs> um, but you know, but but just the habit, just getting into the habit of writing and writing within a boundary. Mm -hmm. Um, improves everyone's ability to communicate. He saw a marked improvement in everyone's ability to write, their ability to create a story. And um, like now you're creative. Now you've moved out of the box that you're normally in, right? You, you, you have a specific task. You have a, both a time and number of words boundary that you have to write to, and it's a specific target. Right. Right. And so it encourages you to use pieces of your brain you don't normally encourage. It encourages you to kind of step out of the box and it encourages you to explore things that either you want to explore, because a lot of us are, you know, we want to write fiction. We want to be the next Stephen King or Mike Crichton or, you know, Lee Child or, or whoever your favorite author is. Right. 
Um, I think even a few of us think we're the, the next great American novelist, or <laughs> in your case, great Canadian novelist. Um, <laughs> and I think that's great. And anything that encourages that, we, we absolutely should, right? Um, so, so I encourage... As a you know, as a leader, encourage your people to do something, right? Even do a, you know, maybe even do a uh, a Zoom meeting where uh, you do like a a paint and sip. You have somebody come in and teach you how to do a painting, and everybody everybody kind of does the same piece of art, and you laugh and have fun, and right. and, and you know, make fun of your own art. Um, I can't do that. Like I have no artistic capability whatsoever. None. I've, I've been doing it. It's horrible. No. At the same time. Um, those activities as team building activities are fantastic. So what happens that, to round out the conversation? So what happens in a year from now when we come back together? It's not permanent, right? There's a lot, there's a, there's a long tail to this working at home and a lot of it's going to be permanent, especially a good percentage, but, but we will come back together, right? We will meet in offices. We will, you know, have QBRs. How does, how do, how do we work both systems where 50% of the time I have this full free flexibility and the other 50% I'm conforming to a nine to five? I mean, the reality is coming back together shouldn't, does not have to mean a nine to five and it shouldn't mean a nine to five, mm. right? If we look at, at um, uh, okay, so if we look at how IT workers originally got classified as um, overtime exempt, in the mm -hmm. US, there was extreme logic behind it, and it was really software developers that it was aimed, aimed at. And what they said was, um, because these people are not task workers, um, and, and they're specifically creatives, they will have long bouts of creativity and then dry spells. And so the company needs to get the value out of them, which is where kind of salary comes from, right? There's a specific val value I'm exchanging dollars for. But that value is not tied to ours. Mm -hmm. um, and so I think we need to look at it much the same way. Right? When you come back to the office, don't expect everyone to come in at nine and be there at 8 a.m. to 5 p.m. I don't know where this 9 to 5 comes from. We're in the U.S. here, sir. It's 8, it's 8 to 5. Um, but don't it's, expect it's everyone to It's dark in be Canada all the way up to 9 a.m. <laughs> <laughs> well, Denver, too. Um, but, but don't expect everyone to, to just simply resume regular working hours, there's tremendous benefit to not having to maintain regular working hours. Mm -hmm. Expect, if there are meetings scheduled, you'll be in the meetings. Like that's a reasonable expectation. Right. But don't set meetings at 8 a.m. just so people have to show up at 8 a.m. Set your meeting at 10 a.m. Right. That way sure. people can drift in and out as they decide they can drift in and out. The benefits are gonna be huge. One, people can much, much more closely set their schedule to what works for their biorhythms, which is great, their productivity will be up. Um, and two, um, we can continue as a society, as a whole, if we enable this, to break down the worst part of the day, which is rush hour. Right. Right. And let's really take advantage of the fact that, that what COVID has done on the positive, more than anything else, is traffic reduction. So True. let's not just immediately jump back into, let's do everything we can to make traffic terrible. Let's do the opposite. Right. The, the, the unfortunate side effect of that is mass transportation, right? Buses can go every five minutes, but trains can't. So you can't really even out a train schedule because there's only two coming in and two going out. So I can't find more trains, right? There's only so sure. many I could put on there. But um, sure, that's true. That, like Toronto is a great example. Like a million people come in and out, right? That, that you're, not gonna, you're not gonna do that with cars. It was just not enough roadway to support that. Uh, but I agree with you that that um, I think it would be interesting if the go forward strategy was uh, virtual assumed and in person surprise versus the reverse. Oh, you're here today. That's awesome. It's never a mandatory requirement, but if you're here, that's awesome. Right. right? That's that's the extra thing. And I agree. You know, there it's almost like you need to look at the full hour schedule and say. Um, uh, the only time to which we meet will be in this three hour window every day. This is the only time to which we'll ever do a meeting that requires, you know, more than three people. Everything else is ad hoc up to you. I think that that makes sense. That yeah. makes sense for the strategy. Carlos, that was a hefty 40 minutes. That was a very good one. And to each of our viewers, I told you that there was going to be a good episode. 
So <laughs> as always, make sure that you subscribe to our YouTube channel, to our podcast. Go to our website, thesweetspot.co, because right there you can see all our episodes. You can connect, you can share it. And as always, my friend, to grow and to lead alone is not good. Make sure that you share this with your friends, family, co-workers, so we continue to grow and be the leaders that we need to be. We'll see you on our next episode.